Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Stuart Bell, and he's a professor of physics and the director of the Space Science Lab at UC Berkeley and the co-founder of the Helio Space Corporation. And I think he designs and builds instrumentation for space. And I think this is a really nice follow-on talk because we've heard a lot about the noise that we get from the Earth when we look in radio and we look in the optical. And you've come up with a way of, of solving that, at least. Thanks, Carla. Okay, so I'm here to talk about doing radio astronomy from the far side of the moon. Um, see, I've got a nice graphic there. Um, in particular, two missions. A mission that's in development that we call LUCY, Lunar Surface Electromagnetics Experiment, and we actually call it LUCY Night for some programmatic reasons. This is uh, in development by NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm the NASA PI, and Andre Slosar is the DOE lead. And then at the end of the talk, I'll tell you about a, a system that we're, develop, uh, that we're studying for Breakthrough Listen that's called the Lunar Farside Technosignatures and Transient Telescope at LIFT-3, led by Dave DeVore, who's around here somewhere. Um, so, so radio astronomy on the lunar far side has been kind of a fantasy for a long time of, of radio astronomers and people who are interested in the moon. You can read about it in, in Arthur C. Clarke's novels in the 60s. And there have been a lot of concepts around uh, for how to do this. In particular, there are some modern ones, uh, a, a pair of uh, systems, one called FarView, FarSide, which is essentially an interferometer that deploys out onto the lunar surface. Um, and another one, the Lunar Crater Telescope from, that's led by JPL. This is the idea of, of erecting a big uh, uh, dish, uh, Arecibo-style dish in a lunar crater. Uh, to my mind, these things are, are terrific, but they're decades away, right? They're, they're billions of dollars and decades away. So what we're doing is the simplest thing possible, or we think the simplest thing possible. We're going to deploy a, a simple pair of cross dipoles uh, in a self-contained instrument box that you see on top of a lunar lander here, and I'll describe this uh, in some detail. So all of this has taken some uh, impetus lately as we have come to understand that there should be a, a 21 centimeter uh, absorption feature in the CMB associated with the very earliest universe, when the, when the universe recombined into neutral hydrogen and went into and out of equilibrium with the with a 21 centimeter spin flip temperature, uh, that should have left a dip in the, uh, in the CMB spectrum. Uh, importantly, this occurred during what we call the dark ages uh, before uh, any astrophysics, before there were stars, before there were galaxies. So it should have been a really simple system, just thermal physics, uh, you know, gravity, CMB, dark matter, and, uh, and hydrogen. Um, but it's a hard measurement to make, and it's a hard measurement to make for several reasons. Um, it's a very weak signal. The predictions are that it's a sort of 50 or 100 uh, millikelvin signal on top of a, a, a foreground, which is hundreds of thousands of times brighter. So the galactic foreground should be you know, 100,000 or a million kelvin at, uh, at these frequencies. Um, the sun and the planets are bright, brighter than the galaxy even, and they have uh, strong emission patterns in this, in this regime. And uh, the spectral feature is broad, right? So delta F over F, you can see the figure on the right shows a a prediction of the, of, the, of the absorption feature, which is in the green band uh, there, and you see that delta F over F is of order one. So any chromaticity in your system uh, could be confusing for the, confused with the, with the measurement. And of course, there's the ionosphere. So the Earth has a, has a, a fairly dense ionosphere, about 10 to the 6 per cc at the, at the E layer, which has a corresponding plasma frequency of about 10 megahertz, so it's right in band. So the ionosphere is, is at worst opaque and at best uh, highly modulated the, the signals from space. Um, so we can't do it on the ground. This measurement cannot be made on the ground effectively. Even near Earth space is, is uh, not a great place. This is a, a waterfall plot from an instrument on the NASA wind spacecraft. It's a year of data uh, showing, and the, the lower band shows you the, the distance of the spacecraft uh, to Earth. And all those little features that you see in, the, in this band, in the 10 megahertz band, are RFI, breaking through the ionosphere. I just told you that the ionosphere is mostly opaque. But it's not. If you put an intense transmitter below it and, and point out, those are all uh, shortwave radio stations, that comes right out. And so even the near-Earth space is, uh, is not a great place to do, to do low-frequency radio astronomy. But we think the far side of the moon is. Um, in particular, you can just, geometrically, you can just imagine it never sees Earth, right? Um, and that was, a, that was proven in principle by the RAE-2 spacecraft in the, in the early 70s. NASA had a spacecraft that went into a lunar orbit. It spent time behind the, the lunar far side, and you could see in that band that's just quiet up the, the, the signals drop out, the shortwave radio stations drop out. So we think the lunar far side is still a good place to do solar, uh, low frequency radio astronomy, and that's what we're going to do. 
So our instrument, is, as I said, is called Lucy, Lunar Surf uh, Lucy Knight, Lunar Surface Electromagnetics Experiment. Uh, the system looks like this. It's in, I should say it's in development. We're, we're de meant to deliver in six months or something like that. The system looks like this. It's this box that sits on top of a lander. The lander is built by a company called Firefly Aerospace as part of the CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program. Uh, we have uh, our own solar panels, the blue, uh, blue bits there. We have our dipole, our cross dipole, so we can do full stokes. The system, the dipole rotates on a turntable, or it's, we're able to rotate it during, during daylight when we have sun on the system um, to, to change the orientation with respect to the regolith and the lander, et cetera. We have a big radiator on one side. Um, uh, importantly, it's battery powered. We were not allowed to propose or to use any radioisotope uh, uh, power for the system. So we have a big battery that's actually a knockoff from the Europa Clipper mission. Um, and one of the devils in all of this is your own EMI. The spectrum on the upper right shows you uh, the, the measurement in the lab from a, a similar radio system that we flew on Parker Solar Probe. All those spikes that you see in there are DC-DC power converters contaminating the spectrum. If you isolate them and control them in the frequency space, you can eliminate them on the bottom panel. But you can't ask a lunar lander to do that on a cheap, on a low budget. And so what will happen after the lander gets us to the surface of the moon, checks us out after the first lunar day, is it will die. It will take, mechanically take the, the power system off of the solar arrays and discharge its battery and be dead forever. And after that, we're a standalone system. Our box stands on top of the lander. We have our own battery, as I said, our own solar panels, our own radiators, our own comm system. Uh, and we're basically a spacecraft on top of a, a dead lander. And then we'll make our measurements through the lunar night. We get there uh, on a mission that's called, that NASA calls CS3 for some reason. So this is a, a mission that's provided by, by Firefly Aerospace. At the top is our, is our stack, our, our spacecraft. In the middle is a relay satellite that's provided by the European Space Agency. It's called Lunar Pathfinder. And at the bottom is a stack, is another spacecraft that's called the B Blue Ghost Transfer Vehicle that goes into orbit around the moon. And I'll, as I'll describe in a few minutes, that carries a transmitter that transmits a signal down to us that we can use for calibration. We, uh, we have a mission design that looks like this. So we launch, we have an Earth phasing orbit, and then we go to the moon. We, ha we launch in uh, early December of 2025. Uh, we have a few lunar orbits, and we get to the surface of the moon in January of 2026, early January of 2026. Our landing site uh, was chosen to be as close to the, uh, to the antipode as possible. Uh, so we're, we're near the anti-meridian, a couple degrees off the anti-meridian, you see in the upper right. Um, and we had to choose to be either south or north of the equator a fair bit to have some asymmetry with respect to the sun. So our radiator sits on one side, it had to either face north or south. We chose the south to optimize the comms. Uh, the relay, <coughs> relay satellites are optimized to support south pole operations, and so we had better comms there. We found a nice flat, uh, horizon, a well-mixed regolith. Uh, we didn't really want to land near anything that would be di a large dielectric. Um, and so we have a 100-meter landing ellipse at, at this site. For reference, the Chinese Xiangyi 4 was uh, where that red pin is there. So the system kind of looks like this. There's a spectrometer, computer, a battery, power supply, uh, solar arrays, peak power trackers, antennas, um, and it's it sort of looks like this. It's a big, it's a big cube, a one-meter cube, essentially, with the battery. Uh, the battery is over here. This is the stack of electronics, the power, uh, the, the solar arrays. And then it's all closed out with, with MLI. The thing will weigh about 120 kilograms or so when it's all, when it's all built up. Um, one of the other devils in the system is the regolith and the antenna properties. Uh, it's hard to know in advance where we're going to land, what the dielectric properties are, are going to be around us. So we've done a lot of modeling, uh, including you know, models of the, of the regolith uh, for our antenna pattern. Um, but to really solve this problem, we've gone with a far field calibration source. So on the orbiting spacecraft, which is called BGT-4, where's my, okay. uh, it's called BGT, or what they, NASA calls this thing CS4. We have a, a pair of de uh, deployed dipole antennas, and we broadcast a, a signal, a waveform that we've provided, which is basically a pseudo-random sequence. It gives us a frequency comb and frequency space. We, we transmit that down to, to our receiver system, and then we can convolve. We have a, a correlator in the, in the, in the uh, a copy of the waveform in the receiver that we can correlate against 
and pull it out of the, out of the galactic signal and, and understand our gain pattern. So as this, as this spacecraft flies past, transmitting to us, we'll see the gain, the modulation and the gain and the phase as it goes over. And this will help us understand the, the antenna pattern on the sky. One of the other problems that I, or one of the things I worry about is actually the regolith itself. So the regolith is structured. It's, uh, it's known to be structured down at about you know, 10 or 15 meters or so below the surface, below what's called the surficial regolith is a, is a region called the upper mega regolith, which is full of boulders, et cetera. So the dielectric constant will change as a function of depth. And these, these depths, you know, tens of meters, correspond to spectral features that'll be right in our, in our frequency band. So this is gonna make it, make it more difficult. We are negotiating with, I should have said, there's a, this mission is gonna carry a, a small rover that's provided by the United Arab Emirates. And we are negotiating with them to put a transmitter on that rover as well, so we could use it as a sort of bi-static radar to probe the, the regolith up. Okay, so it's all, it's all coming together. This is hardware that's being delivered. This is the battery that showed up in my lab a month ago or so. That's the antenna carousel thing that I showed you in the drawing, the spectrometer, the preamps. It's all, it's all arriving in the next few, uh, few weeks, actually, to be assembled in Berkeley. The big challenges are the schedule. We, uh, we have to deliver this thing in quarter one of 2025, and it's not even yet fully assembled. We have to do environmental testing. So the schedule's really pretty terrible. Um, the coupled thermal and power design make it very hard. Um, if you, if you, you know, we, we provide heat for ourselves through the night by burning, by running our spectrometer, 20 watts of heat or so. Um, if you find that the spectrometer needs 25 watts, then you need a bigger battery. You need a bigger battery, you need a bigger enclosure. If you have a bigger enclosure, your thermal design changes again. So it's very hard. We found this to be very, very difficult, but we've, we think we've got it. Um, and I think the regolith is going to be a problem for us, too. It's going to, it's going to introduce spectral features that we won't understand. So we need, we need geophysicists involved in this project, too. So taking all the things we've learned from, from Lucy Knight, um, and which we hope will be successful, we've been studying uh, uh, an instrument concept to do technosignatures work. Um, and transients uh, at, a, at higher frequencies in the kind of UHF L band um, with, the, with the Breakthrough Listen team. So as our previous speaker just showed you, uh, the sky is full of, uh, the sky on Earth is full of spacecraft and this is, uh, these are low fire measurements of, of the Starlink spacecraft and you saw that curve going up, up, up as we fill the sky with, with Starlink. Um, so the kind of signatures that you'd look for, techno signatures in the radio, in the radio bands um, look like that. Potentially, right? So, so doing techno signature work on the ground is very difficult, as, as our breakthrough friends know. Um, and, and it will be the case, if all goes as planned, that the moon becomes like this too. So I told you that, that our CS3 mission, our Lucy Knight mission, is carrying two relay satellites with it. I have an instrument on another lunar lander uh, that's going to the Schrodinger Basin that is also carrying two relay satellites with it. And there are plans for you know, the copious um, missions coming forward, they'll all need, they'll all need orbiting relay satellites, so they'll, they'll be on the ground on the surface making noise. And so the, the environment around the moon is going to become very polluted with techno signatures, or with, with RFI as well. So the motivation for the LIFT-3 project is, is to get there first, to get to the moon and make a, make a nice, quiet, pristine uh, measurement in the, in the UHF L-band um, uh, with, the, with the goal of, of searching for techno signatures. This would be the first private mission to the moon. The instrument concept is a little different. It's essentially, a, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a higher frequency. So it's a, what we're working with now is a small sort of phased array of the Vivaldi antennas on a big plate. Um, and that plate would mount on top of a lunar lander. This is one example uh, of the lunar lander concept uh, that we're working at. It's, a, it's an analog beam forming system with dual polarization. Um, and we can point several beams on the sky uh, and let, this, let the sky sweep over us. Uh, the status of the thing is that we're, we're writing a, a study report. We've, we've been interacting with the, the, the CLIPS lunar lander vendors, the ones who are providing the, the missions for, for NASA. Um, and we've got study reports, or we've got proposals from them. This is all being condensed into a, into a kind of a final report that we'll uh, send back to our breakthrough, breakthrough friends. And that's what I've got, so stay tuned. We'll have data from Lucy Knight in two years, and hopefully we'll be doing something with techno signatures future too. Thank you so much. All right.